Good morning. Welcome to Talk Your Chart. My name is Marco Seguera. I am here today with Brett Horowitz. Brett, how you doing? Good. Good to see you, Marcos. I hear we got some great charts to share today. You're going to predict for us the future of the world events for 2021, right? I'm going to do my absolute best to get the crystal ball that we know we don't have. And, and yes, you're correct. Um, I have predictions on my mind and forecast on my mind because after several conversations with clients asking and begging for predictions and forecast, I'm just thinking, why in the world do we as people want that? Because because I, I do it too, right? I'll do it with, when I go to the pediatrician and the doctor telling something about my son, I want him to tell me exactly what's going to happen, right? Yeah. Because he studied this, right? He should know, he's the expert. Right. So it's funny how whenever we face uncertainty, it's uncomfortable and we want to address that discomfort by having someone we deem as a professional inject certainty that in reality we know doesn't exist, but it doesn't take away the fact that we we want it. Yeah, you're you're in the business, right? You should know what's going on. You should be able to predict the future. If you say, I don't know, then it looks like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He should know. Precisely. And it's funny. And I, I remember the first couple of times that I, I replied to a client asking for, for, for a prediction by saying, I have no idea, <laughs> right? And they're like, wait, what? well, yeah, it's that humility that we approach this world of financial planning, wealth management, and investment management. So it's interesting. So yes, you were right. I have something to show. It's a couple of images, but we'll start here and we'll, we'll run through them pretty quick. It's, it's predictions, right? Each year, I serve on our investment committee. You know that at the end of each year, myself, Lane, the rest of the investment committee crew, we're reading all these forecasts and prognostications put together by big banks and big economic think tanks so we can kind of have an idea of really more than anything else, what are we going to talk about with clients, right? And so we can have thoughtful opinions about what's going on. This right here that we're looking at is a list of just that. Here's what was supposed to go wrong in 2020. Brett, what do you see as a glaring miss on this top 10 list? Uh, COVID, you know, yeah. nothing about what would happen with COVID. Obviously, no one saw that coming. You'd have to be a, a soothsayer to be able to see what was going to happen in February and March. And what would that lead to in the markets? Precisely, right? And it still doesn't take away from the millions of dollars that these big institutions will invest in forecasting. And look, in, in reality, we're not here to make fun of those people. They're all thoughtful, intelligent people that are being asked to do the impossible. And I guess they do their best to do it. It was too funny because just after COVID, so this is called it in April, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs both did take two of their 2020 <laughs> forecast and said, well, we didn't see that coming. Here's the new iteration. Well, isn't that kind of the point, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so you get these top 10 lists, which are usually never correct. And if they're correct, they're not correct with any form of consistency. You also get these lists, right? So these are the evolving risks from the World Economic Forum. This is kind of small, but if you see here, likelihood, you have extreme weather, climate, natural disasters, biodiversity. It's all environmental focus, which again, are all reasonable risks. Again, to what extent are we actually planning for these to happen? The world only knows. And then here we're looking at impact, right? So climate, weapons. What's interesting about this chart is it gives you all the way back to 2007. So at least these people are being very, very straightforward and saying, here's what we were talking about back then. What I noticed was kind of interesting, actually, if you look at 08 and 07, pandemics is on here. And this was also, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is when swine flu, I think 09 was swine flu. So they they, they kind of got it right a little bit with pandemics here, which I thought was interesting. Well, I know that Harold in his, in his newsletter, you know, the last several years has put in a prediction chart and how many of the predictions were correct. And it was probably under 50% where he finally, after 10 years, I think did away with the chart and said, you know, look, this is, it's good as flipping a coin, right? I mean, this is all based on the future and the future is unknowable. So as a result, we can't take too much of what these predictions are going to be and assume that they're going to happen. Precisely. And then this is the last one that I wanted to pull up here, which is, this is kind of what I would call honest predictions, right? And I'll we'll use what in, as an example, the economy will boom and then bust. The value of the dollar will fall and rise. And these are those predictions that sound ridiculous but if you're trying to be correct this is much more likely to be correct 
than trying to point to some idiosyncratic risk and saying this is what we're planning for. So, so is this I, like this is like when the weather person says it's going to rain in Miami? You're just like you know who knows if they're right or they say it may rain. You know somewhere it's going to rain. Well, well, yes, and you know what? That brings up another funny point. Every time I am anticipating no bad weather, no rain because of a weather person, and then they're wrong. Who's holding that person accountable, right? <laughs> who's holding all these economists accountable? No one is, right? And that's, we, we were talking about it before we started this, but Philip Tetlock has a great book um, called Expert Political Judgment, where he basically is pointing to the fact that experts are no more correct than your kind of standard run of the mill citizen. And that the, the more degrees, the more storied, the more headline capturing a professional forecaster is, the more likely they are to be incorrect and the more likely they are to lean in to their incorrect forecasts, right? right? A little bit of that kind of confirmation bias that naturally comes from professionals. Yeah, everybody wants a confident professional, one that knows what they're talking about. I actually read a book a few years ago. It was called Future Babble by Dan Gardner. Okay. I'm going to read a little quote from it that I happened to, to take away because I thought it was really impactful. It said in December of 2007, the very moment that would mark the beginning of the recession, uh, U.S. Business Week magazine ran a chart of detailed forecasts for the year ahead. Under, head, under the headline, A Slower But Steady Economy, 54 economists, all 54 of them, predicted the U.S. economy would not sink into recession and were the unanimous that unemployment would not be too bad, leading to a consensus that 2008 would be solid but unspectacular. One horrible year later, they turned to the same economists who had, who had so spectacularly blown that year's forecast and asked them to tell its readers what would happen in 2009. There was no mention of the previous year's fiasco, only another chart filled with reassuring precise numbers. So I think that tells it all, right? I mean, like you said, there's no accountability. And um, if you if you pretend to know what's gonna happen and you're sure about things and you come out with a face that suggests like, you know, I can really do this because this, this is my career and this is what I'm basing myself on. You know, you're more likely to be in the news, uh, but who knows if you're right or wrong or not. Yeah, correct. And the last thing I'll touch on is when you're forecasting, you can be positive or negative. And as we know, the large majority of any forecast, it's the negative ones that get the attention, right? Yeah, the shark Indeed. attacks, the hit by lightning, all those Precisely. things. You think, oh my gosh, that's happening all over the place. Pessimism, and, and this I'm paraphrasing from a book I read by Morgan Housel called The Psychology of Money. Pessimism is seductive. It has an intellectual allure. Optimism sounds like a sales pitch, right? <laughs> Pessimism sounds like someone trying to help you. So when, when you hear about the economy falling and these, these kind of doomsdayers, right? That are, by the way, doomsdayers, the, the six years ago, seven years ago, doomsdayers, they were saying the markets were overvalued. They all felt validated when COVID hit, right? They, they also said the market recovered too quickly. But again, it's kind of the, the broken watches, right? Twice a day. I think that's what ends up happening um, with a lot of those doomsdayers and forecasters. Yeah, well... Uh, I get asked a lot about predictions as well, but it's on a different topic. It's on a topic about taxes, because I find that a lot of clients are asking, what's going to happen with taxes? Are my taxes going to go up? When are my taxes going to go up? I thought these were two interesting charts that I had seen from a presentation recently. Uh, the chart on the left shows the percentage of taxable accounts that would pres presumably be affected by higher capital gains, right? So foreigners, nonprofits, government, life insurance, IRAs, DC and DB okay. plans, none of those should be hit with higher taxes because they're is all- it, is, this, uh, is this Sembalist the JP Morgan? Yep, yep. That guy is a smart dude, okay. Okay, so you're talking about 20% basically of accounts are in taxable accounts that could be hit with a capital gains increase. And of those, how many people are making more than the $400,000 we're talking about? You know, it's probably a small fraction of that. And then on the right chart, these are the last two times that capital gains have gone up in 86 and 2012. And it starts off a year before they went into place. Because I know, you know, people start talking about this well before it becomes law, right? And so you want to measure it both before it becomes law and then 12 months after it becomes law. And in both cases, the market was up. The S&P was up over that entire time frame. Sure. Yeah, this so, is um, this is good perspective. And this, is, this plays right into the prediction arena. All right, and we obviously have a ton of clients that are either actually trying to realize gains now or really considering it. From what I understand, I think it's been interesting to see how 
at least again, perhaps I'm trying to derive signal that's not really single, but I think it looks like Biden took the markets saying you're doing too much with this infrastructure package, right? The inflation targets fired up, right? You saw that the 10 year tips break even, which is basically just saying, what do we think inflation is going to be into the future? I think that market reaction found its way to Biden's desk, or at least to the advisors around him and to the other Democrats within both House and Senate. And they're taking the gas off, off just slightly to say from what was trillions of dollars, now we'll look to billions of dollars. It seems like from what I last heard and, and read that the corporate tax rate is looking like it's gonna settle more around 25%. And I don't think there's much consensus about raising capital gains taxes, which if that becomes a new headline, that'll be obviously wonderful for markets and wonderful for a client's peace of mind. Well, I think to, to your point though, you know, we were talking about a specific president, right? How often are these things then changed on the following president, right? For someone who's in their 50s or 60s or younger or older, you know, you still have got decades ahead of you with different presidents. And so we've seen so often that these things change based on the president. They have sunset rules, you know, tax rates are going to go up in three years, or four years. I'm sorry if they don't do anything because the top, top tax rate that went down from 39 to 37 is set to go back up. So I think it could be a real shame. And, and I don't think it's well thought through for someone to say, I'm going to sell everything now to avoid potentially higher taxes in the future. Um, it could happen, right? We just don't know. And we're putting a lot of faith in something that is out of our, all of our control. Yeah, I, um, I, I, there's nothing more to put there. I agree with you. At the end of the day here, we're all terrible at forecasting, but unfortunately any decision about the future involves an implicit forecast. <laughs> so we will do our best to, to navigate those waters. Well, you know, coming back from what you said at the beginning, you know, we talked about people writing down their forecasts and then looking at them later on. I think the best thing you can do, whether it's a, a stock or an opinion you have about the economy or day trading or whatever it is, you know, write down why you think something's going to happen and then go back to it later to see if that did happen. If you find out that most of your predictions are coming true, I guess you're a pretty good forecaster. But I'd argue most people are going to get at least half of them wrong. Um, and, and for the reasons, and maybe they're, they're right, but not for the reasons they said they're going to be right. Yeah. And if you get half wrong, I'd say that's a pretty good batting average. Right. And to your, to your point, the postmortems, right. After a decision has been made and you have the opportunity of an outcome, taking a postmortem is wonderful. Right. It's just tough. So I think, and this is, it might be Kahneman who did this, right. Danny Kahneman, who said this in order to make the best decision, three factors need to be present. Number one is expertise. So you're familiar with the area that you're making a decision in complete information and very quick feedback, meaning you know if you got a good or bad outcome in relatively short order. Those three things, if you had to pick the type of decision that that is all present, it's more like picking an ice cream flavor, not picking what tax rates are going to be like, right? So yeah, if, if forecasting stock markets was like picking an ice cream flavor, I think, I think I'd have an island by now, right, Horowitz? <laughs> Yeah, I know DFA, my last thought here is that DFA, I know, has done seminars where they said, you know, I think the problem with predictions, and especially in the financial world, is that uh, in most cases and other things, the more knowledge you have, the better you're able to figure out something, right? Whether it's science or math or sports or whatever. But when it comes to financial markets that are unpredictable, right, the more knowledge you have, it doesn't mean you're able to predict what happens in the future. You know, it says nothing about what's going to happen and whether you're going to be right. And so you could have a lot of knowledge. It doesn't mean you know what's going to happen in an uncertain world. I trust you, Brett. That is wisdom. Thank you, my friend. This was fun. Oh my God. We'll do it again. Yes, sir. Talk soon. Bye.